Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladocast, episode 30. 3 0. Welcome aboard, listeners. Who would have believed this ramshackle affair would have lasted this long? <laughs> or that anyone's still listening to it. No, nobody, <laughs> nobody would. I'm Steve Tudor, by the way. I'm Andy Lewis. And I'm John Cage. And this is normally a podcast about tabletop games. Normally. Uh, board games. Yeah, well, we, we do get diverted several <laughs> times. A minute. <laughs> yes, yes, that's yes. fair. <laughs> but by uh, Steve's magical editing skills, he pulls a podcast from the wrecks. <laughs> Don't ruin the magic. Not magical. Man. It's just hard work. That's what it is. Mm. <laughs> Graft. But we're to- we are told that the 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 the, the horseshit element is actually uh, the best bit. Screw the board games. Let's just drop those <laughs> into a fire and just talk shite for an hour. I thought that's what we were doing. Oh yeah. <laughs> Loosely themed around board games. Speaking of podcasts, Mr. Cage, you've mm. had a, a recent um, escapade. Which escapade are we referring to? Well, we're, we're speaking to your uh, guest slot on We're Not Wizards. Ah, uh-huh, yes. Oh, don't give <laughs> him any more bloody credit. You've actually listened to it now, have you, Steve? Yeah. Uh... And, w- and what was the verdict? Well, you talked about Talisman far too much, you but did, other yeah. than yeah. that... Well, at all, really, that's too much. It was good fun. Hopefully I didn't lose him too many listeners. Hopefully. So if you want to check that out, where can we find it? Is it we'renotwizards.com or is it we'renotwizards.podbean.com? I can never quite remember. He is on Podbean. He's definitely on Podbean and just about every other conceivable way of sharing stuff. So I can't remember what it was now, but there's like half a dozen things he's, he went off with and I was like, really? Those are things? <laughs> Had to go and look them up. So if we were to just type in We're Not Wizards podcast into your search engine of choice, we should no doubt find it, yeah? You should indeed find Mr. Richard's delightful podcast. It was good fun. I enjoyed it. I think, though, I mean, he's done two of the team. So, Steve, probably need to finish the set, don't we? Well, I hope so, yeah. I'm feeling I, a bit left out at this point. I think point. I would actually piss myself laughing if he deliberately admitted, you know. Just, <laughs> just, just why not fuck him? <laughs> no, we don't want him on. He'll just talk well, about honest. fucking Lovecraft all night. <laughs> it's true, <laughs> but let's be honest. Anyway, he's uh, he's found the best one. So um, yeah. yeah, you're right. I was on first. It's it's true. It's true. It's not what he said to me. <laughs> yeah, he's just buttering you up. Yeah, it doesn't totally. Really, doesn't really make you cry. <laughs> I should actually point out, actually, we, we, we've got to questions later, but one of the questions is from Richard from here at Wizards, um, was can we keep John, please? Yes, yes, you've got him, he's yeah. yours. Keep Take him. him. Oh, yeah. hang on. <laughs> he's yours. <laughs> I need to agree quite so quickly, guys. Oh, no, we talked about it for at least four seconds beforehand. <laughs> That's what I get for turning up late, right? <laughs> yeah. He's out. So we can't fire what? Steve because he's the gaffer. Anyway, we've already gone down a rabbit hole and we've hardly begun. So yeah, exactly. let's talk about some games, eh? So me and Andy at the weekend, we played, well, a beast of a game, I think is the best way to describe it, wouldn't you, Andy? I, I would, yes. There was um, mind-bending involved on several occasions and quite a lot of swearing. So we played the game Anachrony. We did. We, we didn't just play the game Anachrony. We played out the ultra-pimped version of Anachrony. Yes, so this was the, the, the full-on Kickstarter version with coloured cubes, which all of us had trouble seeing the differences between a couple of colours, and so. massive miniatures, which I've got to admit, they're beautiful looking, but added, almost completely unnecessary. Added, yeah, added nothing to the game <laughs> whatsoever. Was this another one of your many millions of Kickstarters, Andy? Was it it was not purchase? actually. This is what's. This is the the copy Steve bought from uh, our uh, mutual client Sven at uh, Expo. So this is the first time we actually managed to play the game. Partly because it's taken me this long to learn the rules. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not light. No, although I've got to say it's although it's very complex to me, everything made thematic sense. Okay, so how does one play it? What's the aim of the game? Right. It's a Euro-style game in much the way it works. So it's a worker placement game, and it's a victory point game. Whoever has the most victory points at the end of the game, winner. The thing is, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of ways. Victory point soup. Yes. Point salad. The point yes. salad, or the dessert trolley of victory points. Oh, God, yeah. Right, so you can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this, and you can do this, and then it's like... Oh! The, the main one, one of the bigger bonuses that you can get is... The whole idea of the game is like a post-apocalyptic 
I say post-apocalyptic wasteland. The Earth is a wasteland, and you're all living in some kind of shelters, and you are you represent one of four paths. And I can't remember exactly what the paths are, but each one has a different kind of ideal. Mine was dominance. It was the path of dominance, that. I think. Yes. For some reason, I chose that one. I don't know why. That's unlike you. I know, you never I'm choose s- that route. No, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually the hippie love, you know, making alliances route, rather than, you know, the, the empire. No. I, I, I just, you know, wanted to mix it up. Always good to, to change it up, switch it up now and again. Of course it is, of course it is, yeah, yeah. Sticking to what you know is just boring. So the thing about this game is the, the main board, which represents the kind of world around you, is a wasteland. I think that's going to be the theme of this episode, actually, wastelands, because we're going to talk about something else about the wasteland later. And so if you send any workers out to that place, they have to be protected. And to be protected, they have to go in the bio suits, I think they're called. But they're basically just huge pieces of power armour mm-hmm. that they have to go out into the wasteland to use, which means you have to prep and power up your power armour to send your workers onto the main board. So you need right. to work out ahead of time how many workers you think you're going to need to send out. Um, which Like one turn ahead or...? No, no, on the say at the start of each turn. Um, okay, right. So just after the, the sort of the, the reset phase, you've got to decide right. I want to power up. You get well to start with. You get three free or up to three free. After an event, um, we'll come on to later. But it, it basically becomes a little more expensive. But you've got to decide on how many workers I think I'm going to because you've got your player board and you can do things on that, and you get obviously a limited number of workers which you can recruit more of. But you've got to decide how many of these power suits you need you want to send out. So if you get it wrong, it can be too. It can be very expensive. So you basically spent um, what we call power cores for nothing, or you don't prep enough, and you're like, "Oh shit, I need to do that as well." Fuck, which has a massive effect on your strategy, as I discovered to my detriment. I was just about to say, judging by Steve's grin, you forgot, didn't you, Andy? <laughs> I fucked it up one out of the seven turns. Which had such a big knock-on effect. It that's... really did. Jesus. Excellent. So <laughs> this on its own would be complicated enough because as you progress through the game, you'll build facilities in your base, which are worker placement slots, which do not require power suits because they're in your base. It's also worth mentioning as well, there's three different kinds of workers. So the four. scientists... Four. Hang on, hang on, we've got to get to that. Scientists, engineers, and admin staff. And there's a fourth worker, which can be used in place of any of the other three. Right, so like a wildcard uh, worker. Yeah. Genius! And s- certain slots give you bonuses depending on which work you send to them, and certain slots certain workers can't go to, like an admin can't go down, down the mine to extract raw materials. Fucking slacker office workers, I don't know. So... There's this extra layer of complication, which means compared to normal worker placement games, you're already at a point where we've introduced several concepts, you know, different workers, power suits, building things, and then the time travel kicks in. (laughs) Time travel? (laughs) Yes, Mm -hmm. the whole point of the game, the whole story is they've discovered this time rift, and from this time rift, they've had a message from the future that an asteroid's going to hit and completely screw up what's left of the planet. So one of the main goals of the game, one of the main ways in which to score victory points, is you can prep to run your escape pods. And there's a point in the game, and it's, ma- it's quite clear when it happens, that the asteroid will hit, and after that point, everyone's basically going to scarper off the planet as quickly as possible, and you get bonus points depending if you've achieved certain things, depending on what your uh, which player group you've set, so okay. which, which colour is. The real mind-bending stuff is be- you can power up the time rift... So at the beginning of the round, you can request resources from the future. Right. And you get these resources <laughs> straight away. But in order to stop the time, timey-wimey going go wibbly-wobbly and causing all kinds of paradoxes, at some point in the future, you're going to have to go back in time and send those resources back to yourself. Okay, so you have to pay for them later on, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, and the longer it takes you to pay for them, the more chance you have of causing the paradox. And a paradox is basically one of your building slots gets taken up by this little, like, useless building, which not only costs you three minus three virtue points if it doesn't if you don't get rid of it by the end of the game, costs an absolute fortune to remove. Right, and you lose a worker. Oh, and it kills your worker in the process. Yes. <laughs> And there's one point in this game when I had three paradoxes on my board. Mm, Steve gambled and lost. <laughs> yes. 
As long as I don't roll a two, I'll be fine. Rolls a two. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so calling this a complicated beast of a game is, I think, an understatement, really. I, I would agree. It was... I mean, the thing is, though, it's like all worker placement games. Once you get your head around it, it's actually pretty straightforward. The strategy mm. of it, again, it's like playing Arve Roma. Um, it's just there's so much to try and think about to start with that trying to form a strategy was just insane. Um, although the third member of our group uh, seemed to have no problem with it at all and wiped the fucking floor with us. Has he or she played it before? She has not. No, Alora was down, and uh, we all played it for the first time, and she won by a country mile. Oddly, though, because she didn't use the timeline. Right, okay. She just went in a linear fashion and cracked on yeah. with it. Yeah. So it wasn't just that you two were dicking each other over and therefore <laughs> gave her a window of opportunity. Um, not really. I mean, we weren't actively dicking each other over because it's difficult to do that in worker placement. I mean, you can by proxy dick each other over by taking up a work you know a worker placement spot on the board that you know your opponent wants although you only find out of that when they call you something rather naughty uh, when you do it which i did several times you did yeah. yes yes i said what's that steve oh you wanted to build something oh well never mind but it's it's not one of those sort of backstabby games it's just you know this it's worker placement you know you put something down you do something and away you go it's just obviously spots are limited so okay. uh, yes but, yeah, somehow Steve and I... Well, actually, yeah, I know exactly how Steve and I managed to screw it up. It's because our brains didn't work, and the start of every turn, we went, oh, shit, we didn't do that! Bollocks! <laughs> so, basically, she paid attention and you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. <laughs> I'm not, not going to disagree with that. Can't defend that. <laughs> or Steve and I were trying to be too clever and our brains couldn't handle it. <laughs> I think that was partly it as well, actually. I know. Let's get victory points by doing lots and lots of time travel because you get VPs for doing it. The more time jumps you do, uh, the more VPs you get, and it, it, it ramps up quite quickly, so it's it's not quite linear. It's Obviously, it's not quite exponential either, but you know what I mean. The, the more you do it, the more reward you get. Except that you do still have to pay those checks at some point. <laughs> yes, you do. So you've got to weigh up, is it worth me doing this for the for the extra couple of victory points or shall I just you know, sod it and live with it? So I think Steve and I decided, right, fuck it, we're going to do lots of time travel, which uh, didn't really work. <laughs> so we both got a lot of paradoxes. I also seem to miss all the amazing buildings that Laura was getting. Yeah, she did get a few. Because I, I obviously wasn't paying attention because there's only ever two buildings of each type available at one time. And as people buy buildings, different ones become available. And it was like, come to the end of the turn, and she goes, right, I'm going to send a worker there and gain six water, one of water with one of the resources. I'm like, you're doing this every turn. How? Well, I haven't got any water. Why are you getting all this water? No, indeed. We were running out of water tokens at one point. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I noticed that there was one similar to it, but quite late in the game where I got five water, but I got a VP every time I did it. And the worker I used there came back awake because one of the mechanics in it is that your workers, once they've done something, they have to rest. And you haven't played you for you, have you, John? Mm, don't think so. Uh, dice placement. It's another Stonemaier game. I like it, but it's the dystopian one. And if you want to uh, basically recruit new workers, you have to either shock them into obedience or wake them up with a fire hose. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's similar in anachrony. You have two methods by which you can wake your workers up. You can either sort of basically go in with a stick and beat them awake, at which point they come back a bit, you know, annoyed and their morale drops. Or you can spend a shitload of water and, you know, hose them down. Um, Offer them the carrot. It, it, it's yeah. supposed to be you're feeding them, you're looking after them if you're spending all the water. Yeah. You're not hosing them down, you're, you're being nice to them. See, I was the dominant one, so screw that. They get they get de-lousing powder in a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll like it. And they did like it, their morale went up, it was fine. Um, but of course, the, it's it's a very expensive activity. It, it costs, you know, at least five water. And the more times you do it, the more expensive it gets. Right. So you've obviously got to get this stockpile of water. And Alora never seemed to have this problem uh, until you know, I noticed it probably about three turns from the end. And I got this other building that gave me this benefit. But water is definitely a premium resource in that game. Because it, you need it for everything, even for building some of the buildings. Okay, so you, you enjoyed it then, or...? Yes, very much so. Steve has been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks, Andy, you are going to love this game. And and he was right. <laughs> yes. 
I mean, it's a bit of a bugger to learn because there's so many different aspects to it. Mm-hmm. But as I said, I think everything about it made sense to me. It was, you know, it made thematic sense. Yes, there was yes, nothing yes. in it where I kind of thought, "Why are you doing that?" It was, you know, you had to pay for things, and and sometimes it even said like there was one you could request workers from the future, so you could actually send your workers back in time. And it says if you do that, you got to pay a water as well. And it says the reason being that humans traveling through the time stream it puts a lot of stress on them. So they need like a cup of tea when they come back. <laughs> <laughs> if I just have traveled back in time, I think I'd want a cup of tea. Totally, yeah. So yeah, David uh, David Turksey. So this is actually interesting. The same designer that um, designed Petricor that we we covered a little while ago now, and we weren't overly enamoured with Petricor, but Anachrony is so much better. It's brilliant. Mm. He's pulled a blinder with this one, and I've, I haven't even scratched the surface of what's in that box because to teach myself the rules, I played the single player variant in there. And when I say single player variant, usually there's some tweaks to the rules. No, this has a whole new player board, a whole new set of miniatures for the AI player. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a level of bling. It's kickstart a bling to the max. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, any. There's, there, why do you usually need a set of miniatures to represent, like, characters taken by the AI, but they've put the whole set in? And when I say miniatures, they're. Yeah, they're, they're bigger than your bog standard Space Marine, aren't they? They're not little things. Oh, they're hefty. They're probably. I don't know, six, seven centimetres high? Um, and that the single-player variant, it's got these really complex rules that you roll a dice and you move these tokens around to see what the single, what the AI player does every turn. You can't anticipate his actions. That's quite interesting. Two or three expansions in the box, and then because this is the Kickstarter, there's two more expansions with it as well. So um... Yeah, because the game's tiny without them. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of thing where you need a pallet truck to move it around. Yeah, this yes. is the game that nearly put Steve's back out at Expo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Sven gave it to us just as we were playing Batman. And I said, well, I'm going to have to put this in the car. Picked up and went, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be back in a bit, Andy. I'm just going to put this in the car. <laughs> so after sort of, you know, 25 minutes later, he came back with a, with a, with a Zimmer frame and, uh, <laughs> and, a, and a neck brace. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So you guys yes. played it with three the other day, and you can play it with one. Is there like an upper limit as to how many? Four. Um, Bog standard game is four because there's four different factions in the game, mm. and then as I said, each each faction has got slightly different escape conditions, so slightly different things they need to do to get the victory points when they escape. And also, there is a reverse side to both uh, because you get like a little board which represents your special abilities and the main board. Each one of them can be flipped, and as an alternative on the other side. Um, which it recommends for advanced play. And they're quite interesting because all the uh, morale and time travel victory point tracks are different for each player as well on that one. So on the A side, it's the standard. On B side, every single one is ever so slightly different. Mm. So as well as being quite a complicated game to learn, it sounds like there's probably like uh, quite a lot of longevity in it. Very much so. I reckon it's probably about 10 games before you've played every permutation of it. Or more. But mm. Yes, yeah. There's there's a lot in there um, and a lot to learn. I think forming a decent strategy will take you at least two or three games. Yeah, because my um, my solo game didn't provide me with any strategy to use in the multiplayer <laughs> game, did it? No, indeed. <laughs> Jesus, I can believe that. Oh God, Cause, yeah, because you actually of the three of us, you came last. <laughs> I did, did no. I think it wasn't even that close. There was about it was about ten points either side, wasn't there? I think it was twenty points behind Alora. I think I yeah. got about forty something, and she got sixty something. So, yeah. and I was it's in not the as even if it was close. Yeah, no, it was decent it was margin. Hard. Yes. So I think me and both Andy are both very impressed with this game, and I'm actually quite eager to play it again. Yeah, me too. And that's that's anachrony. We're both well chuffed with that. Mm. Another worker placement game that me, you, and Alora played, Andy. Was, yes, was Sulking. Not quite a new one, this one. This one's been out for some time, hasn't it? Sulking. Sulking. T Z O L K apostrophe I N. Uh, it's mm. based on uh, the Mayan calendar. So there's a lot of sort of Inca artwork and references to that, and lots of Inca sites are mentioned in the game. But I got this for my birthday at the end of July. Um, and Laura was very good of uh, good of her to buy me the game and its expansion. So she nice. she obviously knows me and my completionist ways and thought bollocks to it. I'm getting both. It'll just keep him quiet. 
<laughs> I must admit, so, I saw uh, the pictures of it, and it does look very interesting. There's lots of cogs on the top. <laughs> That's the one, yes, yes. The game sets up with six cogs. There's a central large controlling cog, and there are five smaller cogs around the edge. One of those five is slightly bigger than the other four. The, f- the four smaller cogs represent... Well, actually, all five sets of cogs represent actions you can take, like in a normal worker placement. But they represent different aspects, I suppose. One of them represents food gathering. One of them represents kind of resource harvesting, like stones, gold, wood, all that sort of stuff. One of them represents your, I suppose, civilization advancement. So you can build, you can research, that sort of thing. And then the fourth cog is kind of trading through God's worship, that sort of thing, yeah. And the last one is the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It is. It? Basically, this is Indiana Jones. There are literal, actual crystal, blue crystal skulls that you are supposed to collect, uh, and they're worth victory points. So on this final sort of larger cog, the uh, Chichen Itza, or as I like to call it, the Chicken Schnitzel. <laughs> <laughs> so the aim is to collect victory points then? Uh, it is a victory point game, yes. So like yeah. most worker play, it's another worker placement, as Steve says. It's a, it's Actually, this is very similar in a lot of ways to Anachrony, because it's, it's a... It's a worker placement game. It's your dessert trolley of victory points. It's another mind-bending game where you have to kind of go, hang on, I need that to do that, to do this, to do that, mm. to get some points. Um, but the way in which it plays out is so very different to Anachrony. Oh, it is. They're both completely different games, aren't they? Yes, it is. I mean, whilst you need to plan ahead in Anachrony, obviously, because there's... there's, there's obviously time travel and stuff involved, in Sulkin, the level of forward thinking and number of brain threads, processing <laughs> threads, basically, that your brain needs to have to form an effective strategy is ludicrous. Um, because unlike most worker placement games where you put your worker down and get the benefit, in Sulkin, it's reversed. You put your worker down, which costs you or can cost you uh, corn, which is kind of like the universal currency in the game. It acts as food and, and you're paying for stuff. You don't perform the action in Sulkin until you take your worker away. So every turn, you can choose to either put workers down. The more workers you put down, the more expensive it is. Or you can choose to take workers off. So essentially, you're prepping your future actions with putting them down, and then you perform the actions by taking them off. You don't have to take them all off or put them all down. So you can you'd quite often put a few down to start with, wait a few turns. Because at the end of every turn, you turn the main cog one step anti-clockwise, which then rotates all the other cogs clockwise. So they advance further up each dial on the other, the other areas. And the further around these dials you get, the more powerful the actions generally are. So the, on the food one, you collect more food for the single action. On the resource one, you get more, more valuable resources. So the, long, the longer you stay on one of these cogs, the more resource you get. Is that what you're saying? Basically, yeah. You get a more powerful action out of the end of it. Although if you stay on the yeah. wheel too long, you pop off the end of it and you have to start again. I looked at the um, the board, and it looked like all the different cogs, they're different sizes and things. So does that mean that when you turn the main cog, the other ones turn at different rates? The th- the, well, there's the main cog in the middle. There's the Chichen Itza, which is slightly bigger than the other four. Then the other four are all the same size. So you've got a, okay. I think it's a 10, a ten the small ones are 10-spoke cogs, uh, so 10, 10 teeth, rather. The the chicken chicken schnitzel is... Um, 13 um, teeth, and then the main cog is 20 or 30 teeth. It's fucking huge. Can I, can I take an, an, just a moment to be a complete engineering geek here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the gear teeth are involute gear forms, which not many people listening are going to get this unless, they've got, unless they know about mechanical engineering, but I was so chuffed that they were involute gear forms. It's like, yes! He was. He spent two minutes pointing this out to us. So, of course, Laura's like, what does that mean? Oh, that was it. That was, that was five minutes of this is how a gear tooth works. And he started demonstrating it. I was about to ask that question. Maybe, maybe we don't have time. <laughs> Let's just say it's an engineering form of like how the gear tooth is curved, and I remember having to sit through several hours of mathematics to explain the exact curve of a gear tooth. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think I get it. 
<laughs> yeah, it's basically the shape of the tooth. And he was very happy when this was pointing you. He's like, oh, my God! But that, this must be the only podcast in the world where you're going to hear, hear the term involuted gear. <laughs> Challenge accepted. So you you can turn you turn this thing, and every turn, everything moves around one. And then at the every sort of quarter turn, sort of full quarter of this big wheel, you have what's called the food day. So you've got to pay for your workers. You've got to feed them uh, with corn. Workers generally cost is two corn each, unless you've got various farms and stuff that can reduce the cost. And then during this phase, you get rewards for your faith at each of the three temples. So you've got little stages up the temple that you can worship at, and you can proceed up these temples. The further up you get, the more VPs or the more resources you get, depending because there's two types of food day. <laughs> so um, the first quarter and the third quarter are sort of resource food days. And the first half and second right at the end of the game are kind of victory point um, food day so you get victory points and rewards for for being on that point of the temple and then you do the end of the game and you get loads of victory points for that so during the game you can build monuments which are very expensive buildings that can will basically multiply up certain aspects of your vps oh it's a nightmare and you can you can improve your technology so you can improve how you feed and how you research and yeah exactly it's a nightmare sorry steve you asked okay so there are many many ways to score victory points and yes. it's nice and complicated there's plenty of uh, juicy strategy in there for you that's yes. what i'm sensing there's plenty of moments where Andy has got one elbow on the table, the other one, his hand of that elbow, cradling his forehead, and is it just <laughs> like whispers. You can almost hear him whispering to himself, like, if I put that there, then I can get this. Then. And then suddenly, shit! Hang on, no, no, I've got it. No, if I could do that one there, and I do this one there, I've got that one. <laughs> Pretty much so like it, what we did in Anachrony as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's the equivalent of uh, in Robo Rally when you're there, like, moving your hands forwards and then turning around a little bit and then moving yourself forward a little bit and then turning around a little bit and then going, It is, but a complexity is multiplied by about 100, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you also got the added thing that because the, the, the gears all twist, at one point you do look like you're trying to do a DJ set. Because <laughs> you're trying to work out where waka, it's going to fit. <laughs> That does sound like fun. I would say one of the things that I found a little bit of a criticism of Tolkien was whereas I found Anachrony, every single action had some kind of thematic sense, mm. I found a couple of the ones in Tolkien were a bit abstract. Which mm. ones? Um, it's the technology ones I found were a bit... didn't make as much sense as, as, as most of the other things on the board. Okay, okay so yeah. gathering food made sense, gathering resources made sense, building buildings, but there was these tracks which were like technology advancement tracks, weren't they, where yeah. you, you could spend actions to move up these tracks. And I just felt found they were just a little bit... They felt a bit too gamey because there was a track for each of the main discs. Yeah. Like mm. Each of the main gears. So um, it's, that was the minor one. There was a point when... It, it's just Once you're into the game and realise what things do, it's not so bad. It's just that first game where you're trying to learn what things do. It just felt a bit, well, why, why should I be bothered about that? And it, it twigged like five minutes from the end. It's like, <gasps> oh, of course, yeah. that's what I need to do to get loads of victory points. Yeah, exactly. I was going to yeah, say, yeah, totally. surely the answer is going to be that you earn victory points. That's the reason it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, pretty much, yeah. Um, I have since played it a couple more times, actually. Uh, with the expansion, mm. and that makes a hell of a lot of difference. It makes it even harder! <laughs> of course it does. It sounds like this game doesn't really need to be any harder. <laughs> um, well, it's not that complicated once you get used to it. It's Again, it's, it's, it's the same as most worker placement games. You have to learn everything before you start. It's not mm. one of these things. It's not one of these sort of styles of games you can learn as you go along. You have to learn everything because you need to know what all your options are ahead of time. So all the expansion does is give each player, they basically represent each tribe of the Mayans, and each player gets a special ability. So you can choose, you get, you get dealt two and you choose one. Um, but also it adds a fifth player if you want to play with a fifth player. And also it adds cataclysms. Right. So for every quarter of the game, a new event, apart from the first quarter, so the last sort of three quarters of the game, you get this sort of horrible event. 
and it usually has a detriment to one aspect of the game. So either, you know, your place of work is down, costs you more food, or every time you, you, you mine, you get less resource or whatever it is. So that adds an extra degree of fun to the proceedings. But it also punishes and rewards you at the same time. Punishes and rewards. Yeah, so if you have... Usually the the cataclysms refer to a certain aspect of the game, like either resource gathering or food gathering, whatever it is. And it usually refers to one of the wheels on the game. So if you've got a worker on the wheel at the, the end of that quarter, because each cataclysm is specific to a quarter of the game, then you don't gain or lose. If you don't have any workers, it usually punishes you five victory points, which is a lot. And if you have more than the required numbers, like a, a graded system... Uh, you end up with even more victory points. So it's a complete bastard. So if you know there's a cataclysm coming, which I guess you don't? No, you do. It's turned over at the start of each quarter, so you know the effect for each quarter. So you can plan towards the end of it. It's fine. You can see it coming. Mm -hmm. But you've got to take it into account. Yeah, okay. What is quite interesting is you say you need to know everything up front. One of the things you do get at the very beginning is you get to choose... But you've got four tokens, you get to choose two of them, which are your starting resources. Yeah. So whereas a lot of games would say every player starts with this, you actually get you've got a bit of a selection. <laughs> well, um me and Alora looked at them and kind of went, Well, food, there's corn. Corn's appearing a lot on these. Corn looks important. Let's make sure we start the game with lots of corn. Andy went, Oh look, shiny gold things. Yes. And a worker. I don't work. That's it. You had an extra worker. So you thought, say, oh, great. I've got an extra worker. I can do loads of work. And surely. Kids, but we had to feed our workers. Yes. And Andy suddenly realised that, number one, he didn't have any food. And number two, he had more mouths to feed than anyone else. If there's an opportunity for Andy to get more workers, obviously he's going to do it. Because he does that of in course. every single game he plays. <laughs> yeah. Usually it pays off. But in this one, it, um, no, it, really it did not work. And did it? I had to take advantage of the begging element right at the start. So if you have, if you don't have enough money at the start of each turn, you can beg, which gives you up to three free corn. But you begging angers the gods, so uh, <laughs> you uh, you you go down on one of the temple tracks of your choice. So I was actually sat on about minus three victory points for about half the game. So that did not work in my favour. So you won this game in the end. Um, Alora. <laughs> uh, there's a theme emerging here. I was about to say the same. <laughs> and we played again last weekend, and she won that as well. Is this why you like and... playing games against me, Andy? <laughs> um, maybe. I beat you at Robo Rally though last week. Exactly. Oh yes, it is. But I played against my friend Lisa on Monday night, and I. I had no idea she she plays board games. So I went along. She said, oh, I like really heavy games. So I ended up playing Ticket to Ride and a few other bits and bobs. And I said, do you really want to play this? Because I sort of took along Caverna and stuff. Hang on, that doesn't make sense. You said you said heavy games and then said Ticket to Ride. Well, no, that's the thing. Because she, she had no idea what a heavy game actually meant. So I took right, along okay. these really heavy games. Because um, she'd mentioned, have you got Agricola? I said, no, I've got Caverna, though, which is basically Agricola too. Oh, right, brilliant, because my friend's got that. So she's learned Ticket to Ride and decided that's a really heavy game. So I took these, you know, Scythe and all this sort of <laughs> stuff. Like, she's like, oh, my God, she wants to play them. Brilliant, but she had no idea how complex they were. So we ended up playing Sulkin because it looks cool, and it does. And she <laughs> spanked me at it. <laughs> she got something like 80 victory points. She's never played it. How many did you get? I got my ass handed about 50, 60, something like that. She spanked me at it. So I, I felt quite emasculated at that point. That, see, that happened to me this weekend. So on Saturday, the day before we, me and you were playing Anachrony, um, a few of Amanda's friends came over and we introduced us, them to some board games. So we played a couple of like Amanda's favourites. We played Ticket to Ride, we played Splendour, we played Potion Explosion. And so a friend, Sarah, we're teaching her uh, Splendour and she's playing the entire game as if she hasn't got an absolute clue what's going on. She's like... Continual asking questions. What, what, so what, how does this work? How does that work again? How does it do this? And it comes to one point. She goes, what happens when you reach 15 points? Well, then it, it's the end of the game. Oh, so what actually happens at that point? Well, because Amanda was first, if, if anyone other than Amanda, you know, gets to 15 points, everyone else has a go until everyone's got the same amount of goes. So I've just got 15 points. <laughs> oh, right, so you've won that. <laughs> Because you're the last player, so no one else gets a go. Well done, Congratulations. Sarah, yes. God damn it, yeah. Nice. 
And she went to b- bizarre strategy as well. She went completely different way to me and, me and, the way me and Amanda have been playing it for years and completely spanked nice. us at it. Doesn't that feel mm. good? It just goes to show what playing with different people mm. can do for you. Mm. Particularly a game that's obviously got as many options as that. Like there are routes that you'd never have even considered going down. You probably have similar, yeah, similar avenues normally. <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand how Lisa did it. She always seemed to have a shitload of resource in Sulkin. And it's something I've never really managed to get. I always really struggled, although I had tons of corn, which did me no good, but never mind. So that was it. That was uh, that was interesting, because we played Carcassonne. She won that. We played Sulkin. She won that. We played Ticket to Ride. She won that. 3-0. <laughs> oh, well. You guys need to practice some more. Yeah, apparently so. Oh, well. But, that, yeah, that was Tolkien. So, yeah, that was a really, really good one. So that was a, a good purchase on, on, on the, from, my, from my good lady there. Very happy with that. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to play that again. I must have, Now I think I know what's going on. I'd love to play that again. I don't want to play the expansion just yet, though. I want to have another couple of games, just the base rules. <laughs> mm. You think you know what you're doing, Tudor. Yeah, as I said, I, th- I think I know what I'm doing. Well, I know, I know how to play the game now. <laughs> that doesn't no, necessarily know how to win. <laughs> I'd be interested to give it a go, but I suspect it may not be my cup of tea. I'm trying to make those sorts of games more my cup of tea in the same way that if you eat enough olives, you'll eventually, well, think that they're okay. No, I've always been trying to get me to eat olives. I fucking hate them. Disgusting little things they are. I can just about tolerate the green ones, but the black ones can just fuck off. See, when I tried to introduce olives to a mandarin, it went the other way around. Yeah. She preferred oh, really? the black oh, olives. No. Yeah, and then... Which are like it's like uber strong. It's like more olive mm. than normal olives. <laughs> they tend to be a richer flavour, but they're less salty. I would say the black ones. Mm, Vile things. Okay. We're approaching the most middle class of conversations mm. at this point, aren't we? <laughs> There's some statistics somewhere that if you try olives a certain number of times, I can't remember what the figure is. Throw up. Uh, most people, <laughs> most people. Uh, learn to like them if you try them that many times. It's just stoic acceptance. It's like, fuck it, if I just pretend to like them, will you shut up and stop feeding them to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, it works. <laughs> well, I'm too stubborn. Does the same number apply to hummus? See, hummus isn't quite as bad, so it always got me eating that as well, <laughs> which, to be fair, I never really hated. I was just kind of ambivalent about. But, uh, yeah, I went through a bit of a stage. Oh, this is quite good. Can we have more hummus? Thankfully, that has now waned off. middle-class snack factor. Well, you see, it's quite good if you put <laughs> yes. it on, you know, crackers and celery and things, which I've discovered. I'm determined to... to, 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 to what's the word? Get back on with the podcast? No! Well, that too. <laughs> I'm definitely not determined to do that. No, celery. Do you not think it's just basically a Philadelphia delivery system? <laughs> <laughs> It's not a hummus delivery system. <laughs> oh, a hummus de- It is basically dip delivery, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It has no other purpose. <laughs> Wasn't it so stupid, like, that celery takes more calories to consume and digest than mm. it does to actually... It's like lettuce. It gives you. It's pretty much just solid water mm. with a bit of fibre. Yeah. It's just rubbish. It That's all it is. It's, it's just rubbish. Um, yum, yum. So, John, what have you been playing? Well, I went on holiday and... Uh, there's a cottage in the middle of nowhere, and so there's normally an opportunity to play lots and lots of board games. But bizarrely, despite being Scotland, uh, we had like four or five days of gorgeous sunny weather to the extent where we were stood on uh, stand-up paddleboards just paddling around in the sea, like looking at all the fish and things and thinking, this could be in the tropics. <laughs> uh, so consequently, we didn't play anywhere near as many board games as we would normally and sit down for a moment in a week of being out there, we didn't play Talisman once. <gasps> <laughs> Clear. Ka-dunk. <laughs> oh, that was close. So, yeah. So, I didn't play Talisman. Um, we did play a lot of Game of Trains. And I have to say, your reviews, I was right to go off them because they're that game's fantastic. Really good fun. It really <laughs> is, isn't it? I did get a message off uh, Ben. Is your friend who was at um, Scotland to say he's bought a copy of that now as well? I think from that review, I know of at least five people that have bought a copy of a Game of Trains now. Yeah, well, for anyone who didn't buy it off of that recommendation, I would now endorse it. And it's added to that very small list of games that all three of us own, I think. <laughs> uh... So, yeah, 
Go, if you haven't already got a copy, go and buy it. It's really cheap. It's like 10 quid or something. Uh, we played a lot of Tsuro and actually played a new game. Bum, bum, <gasps> ba. I don't believe me's lying. <laughs> I just shit my pants with anticipation. <laughs> well, you might need to unshit them because, um, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> 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 Brace yourself. <laughs> it's like backwards words and red wood. <laughs> I've just choked myself. Where's the cat? <laughs> oh, don't ask. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so sorry. We played Labyrinth. <gasps> Did it remind in, you of, of the Babe? Nah, right. Hang on. Was this Labyrinth, as in Jim Henson's Labyrinth, or Labyrinth, as in the old eighties game Labyrinth? This is Labyrinth, as in Jim, Hem- Jim Henson's Labyrinth. Ooh, dance, magic, dance, yep. magic, dance. <laughs> so, and that uh, is why Steve is not a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a few reasons, in fact. But <laughs> I've got a face for radio as one of them. <laughs> <laughs> or podcasting. <laughs> so do I get to talk about the game? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a game for one to five people. It's aimed at ages six plus, and I'd say that's reasonably fair. In fact, I would sum- summarise this game as a simplified version of Talisman, heavily themed Dross. with Labyrinth. <laughs> so, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before we go any further, does that mean it's roll and move as well? It is roll and move. Oh, oh. And unlike uh, you know, a, a nice in-depth game like Talisman, <laughs> where there's three rings that you can run around in circles. <laughs> uh, there's one. Oh, so it is, it is actually similar to Talisman. It, I thought you were trying to wind me up there. No, but... I'm not kidding. It is a lot like Talisman. So the basic premise is that it's just like the film, and I mean just like the film. So they've tried to shoehorn every single major kind of uh, element that was in the, the film into it and that works like thematically it's fantastic and it feels very labyrinthy so it's really it's a fun way to reminisce about the film i would say but in terms of uh, an interesting and engaging game i think the longevity of it's going to be a bit limited so you each take if you've got four players you each take uh one of the main characters so uh, sarah ludo sir didymus and um God, what's the trouble? Oggle. 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 Yeah. So you each take control of one of those, and they've all got their strengths and weaknesses. So you've got three, I think it is, um, different characteristics. So there's a sort of strengthy one, there's a witsy one, and another one that's slipped off my mind. Anyway, the point is that each of them have got a sort of a, a strength to them. And you've got different sized dice, so you get like 20-sided dice, 10 side, 8 sides. And depending on whether your character's good at it, you get a different size of dice for each of those characteristics so ludo okay. for example is pretty hardcore so he gets like a <laughs> exactly he gets a pretty uh he gets a pretty big dice for that uh, for that role so didymus is a bit more witty so he gets a higher dice for that you're encouraged to kind of team up so you go round and round in circles or slowly yeah. round in circles. figuratively circle. or literally <laughs> <laughs> literally um yeah, you go around in circles, so you roll a dice to move, and you can move up uh, in in one of two directions. You can move up to that dice roll and pick where you land, and then you draw from one deck. So it's just like Talisman. So it is just like Talisman. Oh my god, okay. Yeah. Apart from the fact you can actually move up to your dice rolls, there's a little bit more choice than Talisman. Yes, you could argue that. I can yeah, feel okay. my piss boiling as I listen to this. <laughs> See that you've you've got response in anger. I've just got a response in disappointment. Yeah, and that's how I felt. Because Labyrinth is probably one of my favourite films. It is great. Is there a Jareth miniature? There is a Jareth miniature. And- is it anatomically representative? <laughs> Bulging. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's some good aspects in there. Like it's got things like the Bog of Eternal Stench and the Oubliette and all sorts of other bits and pieces. But right from the offset, uh, I thought it was a little bit marred in terms of complexity because uh, it tells you to pick out the Goblin City card and then basically put it in the bottom third of the deck. So you know, basically the aim of the game is that you've got to go, go around the circle, encounter all these spaces to pick a card up each time, to burn through the deck, 
before the clock reaches 13. And then obviously the child is Jareth's. Forever. Yeah, so it's good fun to begin with. But after a while, you realise all you're doing is just doing whatever move allows you to burn through the deck as fast as you can until you can get to move into the middle. And then it goes from being sort of not too bad, as long as you manage to team up with people. So that's the other th- the important bit. So it encourages you to uh, make friends. So you want to try and land on your colleagues' spaces because once you're teamed up with them, you can use the highest dice roll between you to try and defeat things. So if you've got Ludo, he's a bit stupid, but he's quite hardcore, and Sir Didymus, for example, um, when you try and fight something, you just go through, you both roll, and whoever gets the highest one, you go, right, that's the that's the winning dice roll. Okay, that's quite clever. So I quite like that little mechanic, but that sort of felt like about the only clever bit of it, <laughs> mm. <laughs> to me at least. So when you've got all four of you together, the only d- downside of being grouped together is that you move at the slowest p- player's place, pace, sorry. And so... Yeah, all the other roles are great, except the the one where you've got to escape something by running away. It's like, well, sorry, Hoggle, we're going to leave you. <laughs> Good luck. So what happens when you get to the Goblin City? Right. So that's another thing that I found slightly irritating, is that um, you, when you start off the game, there's like a load of these massive template standees, which obviously have like all the stuff that happens right at the end of the, the film when they're running to get through the city and they're mm. facing like the big like guardian things and the other bits and pieces. Yeah, the, the goblin mechanoid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but so you know that you're going to get to them, and there's like three or four spaces that are obviously going to be occupied by them. <laughs> but for whatever reason, you don't just put them down for the whole game, or they're not like spaces that you land on. So you have to wait until you get to that point, and then you put them all down. And you have to attack them in order. And so it just felt like a weird thing. Like they don't label which space it needs to go down in on the board so you have to look up in the rule book where to put these things down even though there's one only one place that all of them are going to go <laughs> i don't know it just felt a bit weird to me yeah and so basically that final those final steps is all about just getting sarah there so basically the other bit i haven't mentioned is you get these little focus tokens so focus tokens just like fate in in talisman basically they give you an opportunity to roll re-roll a dice uh, you roll a big blue dice in fact so the 20-sided dice so it does give you a much better chance of winning, uh, you know, whatever thing you failed, but at the same time. So the final section is basically just getting Sarah to get to Jareth. And then once you've, assume you make it through all those trials in time. <laughs> were, were you drinking when you played this, John? Uh, there were some beers. <laughs> but the final, the final bit is that there's this card and it's basically the poem that she recites to Jareth at the you very end. You have no power over me yeah exactly Perils and told and yeah so um it says for your first play you can read the card and then you have to recite it perfectly and if you don't you lose the game and once you played it once you have to recite it word perfect without looking at the card which i guess you know if you're a hardcore labyrinth fan it's probably like haha of course i can do this but for us it was a bit like yeah we'll just read the card so it's shit then well <laughs> i think i think it's gonna lack replayability but if you're a massive fan of the game i think you'll enjoy playing it at least once yeah i was torn on this i i almost pre-ordered this and then i just caught this feeling that it's not i don't know what it was because I, I, I don't remember seeing any reviews or gameplay or anything but there's just something i saw just put me off pre-ordering it and um, well we saw it at expo last year didn't we yeah and i remember being really excited about it <laughs> yeah but at that point it was just the miniatures and i think i'd just seen somewhere that said the roll and move aspect and as soon as i saw the roll and move aspect it just went no, no i'm not interested negative captain that game we looked at at the um last expo that scrooge game do you remember that andy Oh, oh Christ, that thing. Jesus, <laughs> so the yeah, guy's yeah. doing this spiel about this game. He goes, I don't know, roll and move. And he was spouting off for about 15 fucking minutes and we were stood there just looking at each other out the corner of our eye, just thinking to each other, will you just be quiet? <laughs> it's shit. <laughs> and it's very pretty. The artwork is fantastic, but it just sounds wank. <laughs> Don't hold back, Andy. <laughs> I won't. We won't say this in person to these people, but we, we'd put it on a public podcast for everyone to hear. Absolutely not. Yeah, we can hide behind the internet. 
but they have to they have to tune in so chances are pretty small isn't it <laughs> i'm sh- i'm sure it'll be enjoyed by kids it, it's a very sort of kid friendly game and that's obviously yeah. their target market but um yeah for 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 us you know highly complicated game lovers who are you know we should probably stick to things like that based on our performance at anachrony but um yeah not not for us really overall i wouldn't really rate labyrinth and it looks like board game geek agrees I'm not surprised. Whoa, whoa. Is this the first game that you don't like, John? Have we actually hit a momentous time in, in your board gaming career? Uh, I'm sure there are other ones that I've disliked, but that's mostly just because they were worker placement games. <laughs> 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 this one I feel slightly... Uh, I think... Do you know what it is? It's not that I'm angry. It's not that I'm... You know, that I really don't like it. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. like when your dad just looks at you. I'm not angry, yeah. I'm just disappointed. How shit do you feel when you hear that as a child? I'm just looking down at the boards, shaking my head. Just yeah, you could have been so good, but I just. But you weren't. No. We're going to do a new segment at the moment, and we don't usually do segments, but we realise we have had a number of review games that have been sent to us, and we do get. We'll be honest, we do get review games sent to us. But the problem is we've found that some of them are not that great. So we present the new section, The Review Roundup. In one. Titan Tactics is a two-player game which is basically a miniatures game distilled into a cardboard token. John, you might remember playing this. We played this about two years ago. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously I remember it then. <laughs> Crystal uh, clear memory. He's not slept or got drunk since then at all. <laughs> and my memory's legendary, let's be honest. This Who was you? a game in which you took three cards for three characters and you basically just fought each other and there was a little tug of war system. So you had little square cardboard tokens to represent each of your, your fighters on the, in this arena kind of board. And as you did damage, this tug of war moved back and forth and wherever the tug of war was at the end of the turn, that's how many points you got. And there are also cards to select what kind of action we were going to do. It's a, actually quite a pretty looking game. I actually got this back out of the box to take some photographs of it to put on, our, on the Polyhedron Collider website. And I forgot how good it looked. But both me and John have played it. Played it once and went, yeah, it's quite good. And then put it in the box and, and never, never thought about it, it again. again. <laughs> it's so good. I actually genuinely don't remember playing that game ever. There you go. It's made such a <laughs> mark on you. Yeah, I said it's not an awful game. The rules are quite interesting. It's just bland. You know, in the in the, the UK Games Expert episode, we talked about the game which was a bit like a cracker with no cheese. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Was that the analogy I made? Yes, it was. Yeah. And um, this game is actually quite similar to that. It's that kind of same kind of theme. It's that two player cardboard characters fighting each other. Mm. Um, and yes, I wouldn't go so far as to call this a bland cracker. If the other one was, say, like a Jacob's Water Biscuit, this one might be a slightly upmarket, maybe a bit, a bit of cracked black pepper or what have you, but... Um, Sounds all right. It's still lacking, lacking something. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, I've... a similar sort of length of time, actually. I've had a game called Upon a Fable, which has been out on the shelves. It's got about four expansions or something ridiculous like that, but... I looked at this one, yeah, probably about a year and a half ago, and I like worker placement. This is one of the reasons I looked at it. Oh, worker placement again. We'll have a look at that. Upon a Fable is based on some kind of fairy tale, sort of generic fairy tale land, and the idea is that you start off with a small realm and you build bigger realms, and the more bigger realms you, you get, you, the more BPs you get. Sounds great on paper, but uh, paper is quite flimsy, unfortunately. And well, what's the floor? The flaw is the fact that the mechanics of the game and the theme of the game are utterly, utterly unrelated. I mean, it's a difficult thing to marry theme and mechanics in a worker placement game, but the really good ones seem to manage it quite well. Um, Crisis, Ave Roma, uh, Viticulture, Euphoria, um, Tolkien, you know, all these things. All of their mechanics and the theme work quite well together. Whereas upon a fable, you could genuinely literally reskin the entire game about, I don't know, a supermarket chain. You know, starting from a small corner shop and working up to a supermarket. And it would the mechanics could remain precisely the same. 
mm. which kind of sucks. So it isn't a bad game. In t- I mean, it works. You know, the mechanics work. It's just dull. So Frantic is a card game, which if I described it as being similar to Uno, I could basically leave the review there. Right, let's do that and move on. <clears throat> when me and Andy played it, we found out the rule book does not actually include the rules on how to play the game. Yeah, it, nice. it was a novel approach to, uh, to a yeah. rule book, we, we thought. It included rules on how all the special cards worked, but at no point did they explain at any point how to actually play the game. So mm. we contacted the developers and said, how do you play this? And they said, have you played Uno? And we went, yes. And ah, they said, yes. it plays exactly the same as that. And we went, oh. Next! It's not really the ringing endorsement, is it? <laughs> no, not really. When you have to have played a different game in order to play the game you're trying to play, it's not a good start. So we also played, at the weekend actually, following our brain-baking game of Anachrony, we decided to give Table Tantrums another go. And that left us not quite with a tantrum. (laughs) So Table Tantrums is a game where you are a Renaissance Italy banquet runner, and just like planning the table plans at your wedding, you're trying to place people onto the table. So we all know that, you know, Auntie Mabel won't speak to Uncle George, so they can't be at the same table. And people want to be as close to people want to be as close to the top table as possible. And that's basically the dining plan and the wedding in a board game form. That sounds like the worst bit of planning a wedding to me. <laughs> it pretty much is, yes. It's, t- it's taken the worst bit of anyone's wedding and distilled it into a shit board game. In theory, the game sounds reasonably interesting, the concepts work, but you start off with a completely blank table. Mm. So what this actually means is for the first three quarters of the game, there are no limits on what cards you can play because mm. you just go, well, there's a blank slot, there's a blank slot, there's a blank slot. And so for a 20-minute game, 15 minutes you just spent going around the table putting cards out and then you suddenly go, right, I've got to think about what I need to do now. Three cards left, how can I get rid of them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, not only that, the artwork is probably not too dissimilar to... You know the the um, the artwork that a five year old child would put together. If you said, "Yeah, draw the table of a party," mm-hmm. it is appalling. I always worry when I try and play a game, and it feels like you know you do two thirds of the game doing this slightly boring mechanic, and then there's like a few decisions at the end. I always worry I've missed something. Like we must have missed something because there's no way that this could be. The actual game, could it? No, this was the actual game. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't great. So we all sort of finished it and went, right, we're not playing that again. <laughs> Speaking of shit artwork, Steve. Oh, yes. So, Sopio, I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know, because I'm pretty sure it's a completely made-up word. It could be Sopio, it could be Sopio. I'm not entirely sure. Is this based on uh, a shower room in a prison? <laughs> I think that would be actually infinitely more interesting than this. <laughs> no, if anything, if I was to s- describe this as being similar to another game, it would be similar to Munchkin in that it is a multiplayer take that card game. And you have humorous cards with shit stickmen drawings on, <laughs> which you can play on either yourself, which you generally do if it's a card with benefit, or you play on an opponent if it's a card with a detriment. Makes sense. And that's it. Sounds like Munchkin. What's the problem? Well, for starters, Munchkin is shit. <laughs> <laughs> and this is only slightly better than Munchkin in that Munchkin can take hours, whereas this takes about 15 minutes and then it's all over and we can all go home and do something else. Mm, that sounds better. <laughs> Maybe I should play this game. <laughs> <laughs> Given that I actually quite enjoy Munchkin. <laughs> You're Get weird. out. Get off yeah, my podcast seriously, now. <laughs> Cut his feed. <laughs> well, that's why I'm here, folks. I'm for the variety. So, I think it's time to answer some questions from the mailbag. Mm, Steve's rubbing his sack as, 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 as we speak. Sorry, de- delving into his sack. Either way, it doesn't sound good. Get on with the questions. No. <laughs> so, let's start with a question from Mr Sven Hanneman. And he asks, another local game shop has closed. What is the future of the friendly local game shop? Um, they're humped. No, not really. Um... <laughs> I, I still think they have their place, but I think they need to maybe diversify a little bit. I 
No, we're a bit, it's a bit of a weird one, this one, because in some ways I see the advantage of the friendly local game shop, which I also think is a bloody unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't actually exist. But at the same time, you're paying the privilege of going to a shop and paying more, which I really struggle with at this point in time. Mm. I mean, I don't live in the middle of a city at the moment. I live in the middle of the country. The nearest game shop to me is an hour's drive away in Leamington Spa. So I've also got to pay for parking. It's in the shit side of town. It's on the wrong side of the river. They always <laughs> are as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got, you've got to go park. You can't even like go into Leamington Spa, have a bit of a walk around and pop into the game shop because it's like another mile outside. Mm-hmm. And it's a nice little shop. Fair dues to the guys. They're, they're quite friendly when you go in there. But they're a brick and mortar store. Everything's RRP. I've travelled an hour to get there, I've paid for parking, I've walked down, and then when I go in there, there's a selection of games, which all look pretty good, so I can pick them up and look you know, look at the box. But then I'm paying, well, at the moment, based on board game prices, £10 or £20 more than if I just ordered the game online. Mm. And I understand that they've got their they've got overheads, they're, you know, they've got rent that a lot of internet websites don't have and i know that some game stores have gaming space now this is always a big one that's pulled out when people talk about the friendly local game store is about the gaming space but a lot of game stores don't have this gaming space that you can just go up and use i think the answer is that the future of friendly local game shops is death but from the ashes <laughs> from the ashes of those uh, dead game shops will rise like a phoenix, <laughs> your friendly local game cafe. Ah. <laughs> well, this is the thing. This is why I say they need to diversify. Um, I mean, it's not straightforward, obviously, to just install a cafe in a shop. Of course not. But baby steps, I suppose, is that introduce game nights, introduce things like that. You know, maybe you know, go along, pay a couple of quid to sit down and play a game with you know 20 other people or something like that. I don't know. I mean, obviously, you've got to pay wages and things, so it's a difficult balance to make. Mm. Yeah, but, but if you're selling coffees and beers and things, and you can, uh, you know, you could you could pay like some small amount to rent different games or something like that. I think that's mm. the way to go, and leave the um, you know the cheap way to get games as you buy them online. See, the thing is, I also find tournaments as well are a good thing to do. Mm. Yeah, if I go to I, I go to the odd X Wing tournament, I did a load of Doomtown tournaments. You buy stuff while you're there as well. Yeah. Because okay. one of the game shops, you know, because you suddenly go, well, I'm here now. You know, whereas like going to a game shop just to buy a game, you're making a purpose trip to go and have a bit of a mooch. But when you go to a tournament, well, you're there, you're spending, you know, there's downtime in between games. And while you're doing the downtime, you can have, you know, a quick look at the store and you go, oh, they've got such and such a game I quite fancied that and you go to yourself well it's cheaper online but if I bought it online I'm not going to get it till mid next week there's there's something to be said for impatience but yeah but if you're going to do that sort of thing like you could at a cafe you could have like a a tournament day and you could have you know someone come in with uh, a stall of all the local miniatures or whatever yeah I mean one of the big things one of my friends well, my friend who was a big miniatures game always hated was he wanted to go into a store to buy miniatures games to look at the miniatures. Yeah, yeah, I could get that. Yeah, be- Because he wants to look at the pack and see, right, well, this is the detail that's on this miniature. But he said he was always annoyed that because of the overheads, very few miniature game shops have the stock. Mm-hmm. You know, they all say, oh, we can order that in for you. Well, he goes, well, I can order it in for myself and get it sent to my house. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> probably for less. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, one example, I mean, Laura and I were in York a few months ago now, and we went to Travelling Man. Mm. And that, that is a lovely, lovely, lovely game shop. It's a really nice atmosphere. It's clean. It doesn't smell. It's, I don't think they do food or anything, but there was some gaming space at the back. They had a table. It was light. It was airy. It was, it was a nice place to be. And I think shops like that probably have a future because, you know, you go along and just mooch about and, you know, you're not sort of crammed into some sort of sweaty corner pokey shop. Um, you know, full of full of bearded nerds that don't really want to give you the time of day. They're just there to play some games. Whereas Traveling Man was was a really nice shop. You know, it was like mm. any other sort of boutique almost. It was. And they had a really good range of shops. Now, of course, I mean, we know Traveling Man. They go to a lot of the big conventions and stuff. So they obviously mm. they have the basis and the and the wherewithal to actually do this. But of course, you know, not there's not that many shops like that. So mm. more's the pity. Yes. It was nice. And I, I may have made a purchase or two while I was there. 
<laughs> well, there were board games nearby and you had uh, money to spend, even if you exactly. didn't have money to spend. <laughs> To be fair, I was quite restrained. I only bought one, and it was Android mainframe, and it was only 15 quid. So I thought, well, I'm having that. Sounds pretty good, actually. That sounds a bargain. That's exactly what I thought. It's like, it's a, you know, RRP for 30 quid or whatever it is, and it says half price. So I sort of wandered up to the counter and said, I might understand that this is 15 pounds. And they sort of said, yeah, right, I'm having it. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah, well, it was in shrink wrap and everything. I was like... Really? This 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 is too good to be true, surely. You know, it's fifteen quid, right? I'm having it before you change your mind. Is that just stock rotation though? Is that just a I company? suspect so, yeah. Yeah. Because I have seen it for a lot less than that recently. Well, not less than fifteen quid, but much, much less than RRP. Yeah. It's just because um, one of the, the one of the game shops in Worcester has a obviously doesn't look at stock rotation much because they've got one copy of Horus Heresy, which has been on the shelf now for I think five years. It's still there. It's still the interesting thing is that's becoming more and more of a bargain as time goes on. They don't because do that game's been out of print. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, been yeah, out of totally. print for a long time. I mean, it's an old game. It's 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 showing its age, but if mm. so, it's like the longer they don't sell that, actually, the more the more they might make a profit on it. But there you go. You say, well, actually, you say it's a bad thing to not stock rotate, but to be fair, I took advantage of that by getting um, Battlestar Galactica's uh, Daybreak expansion from them because it was sat at the back. So I managed to get that. Nice. <laughs> so that's completed my collection there, which was quite nice. Alberto Cacodrillo is Paul's replacement. I assume he's talking about Paul Grogan here. Is Paul's replacement talking today or the real deal? How dare you? What does he mean? How dare you? Paul's replacement? (laughs) Okay, fine. I'm a poor imitation of Paul. But yes, I'm here. It's me. I'm really here. (laughs) The whole podcast. (laughs) There you go. Yes, John is here. You have got the eyebrows to impersonate Paul. Oh, that's true. (laughs) Or the love of um, of, of dry Euros, either. That, That is true. That is true. So we also had a question from Gaz at the Village Meeple. Uh, somebody talented and possessing great taste, which is obviously talking about me, um, offers to bling out any one game of your choice. Which game would you choose and why? Mm. There are a couple of follow-on questions to this as well, which uh, mm. he's also asked, have you ever seen or played a blinged out game and thought, why the hell did you bother? <laughs> Uh, and also thought, what's the best blinged out game you've ever seen? Yes, and we've got a couple of related questions. We might as well address them all in one go. Ben Maddox, who's asking, what's the most pointless overproduction you've seen? And we've also got Philip James Harker, who's asking the biggest waste of packaging on a game you've bought. So they're all kind of along the same line. So what do we reckon, boys? So what's the most blinged out? What would you bling out? Now, Andy, you are probably the person to ask this question as you've recently spent a considerable sum of money purchasing the Stonemaier Bling collection, have you not? <laughs> I, I may have purchased one or two of the treasure boxes, yes, yes. Specifically for the purpose. But they are multi-purpose. It's not just single... It's not limited to single games. But yes, I am a bit of a whore when it comes to things like that, it would seem. <laughs> um, most blinged-out game? I don't know. Um... Well, we were talking about Anacrony earlier. We did. I mean, yeah, that was fairly blinged. Actually, thinking about it, I've got one game that is utterly unnecessarily blinged, although it is a limited edition. It's the uh, it's Empire's Age of Discovery, which is essentially Sid Meier's colonisation, but in good board game form. And it's a, basically it's just a fairly straightforward worker placement. Very, very good game. I really, really like it. But... Every player has got this horrendous, a massive set of miniatures for, to, to, to represent all these workers. I mean, they're all very slightly different, but nothing that couldn't have been done with a bunch of punch-out tokens, to be fair. And then there's there's just um, all the money in it is either gold or silver pieces of eight, and they're all, you know, proper textured things. All of the cardboard in it is really thick. I mean, it's lovely. It's fantastic. It looks and feels brilliant. But it's 80 quid, and you could probably get away with it for being less than half that, I reckon, given the content. So that's pretty blinged. Overbling, do you reckon? A little bit, yes. Century Spice Road is one that's a little bit overblinged as well, I think. Mm, yeah. It, it, it's a nice game, but you get little cups to put the token, to put the cubes in. Again, all the coins in that are gold and silver metal coins, which most games would just give you cardboard tokens for. True. It's got an insert which keeps everything neat. However, it's not fully blinged out as the play mat is an optional extra. Okay. Yes. So if you want the little mouse mat material play mat, that's like another twenty quid. So that's not far off. 
yeah. and surgery. But it is only thirty. Well, I say it's, it's about what's thirty-four pound RRP. I think the yeah, it's yeah. But you think if you're taking out the metal coins and oh yeah, you could probably do it for cups. about twenty. Yeah, at a minimum, you know, you just have a pile of cubes rather than just little cups. So yeah, it is. It's nice, but a little bit unnecessary. Mm. I reckon one that's quite blingy but absolutely nails it is uh, Mechs versus Minions. Yes, it does actually. There is. It is very blingy, but you're right. It never quite feels overdone, does it? Yeah, it all feels like it's part of you know a really well put together package. Even just you know you open the box and it, there are shitloads of minions inside there. I mean, like hundreds of the bastards. And you need them, but the way they've designed the box, all the different minions have got like different stances, like they're holding axes in different places, or they've got shields, or um, and it doesn't really matter which slot you drop them into. They fit in any of the slots, even though they're all different shapes, and they fit perfectly. It's it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the other one about that is the board. I mean, it's the the, mm. the board you actually play on is like one of the thickest game boards I've ever seen. But like, you've got two sides. You've got the the green fields, and then the lava and rocks on the other side. Yep. And like, there's oil slicks or, or pools of water, and they've put spot gloss finish. On the oil slicks so and the water, actually yeah, yeah. so you hold up yeah. the light and it looks shiny in the light. It's, it's lovely. It's absolutely fantastic. And there's, I think you're right. It does never feel overproduced. Yeah. It feels like it's just bang on the money, doesn't it? Yeah, and there's metal tokens in there. Um, all the minions, they're not like fully painted. They're just washed with a bit of ink, just to give a bit more mm. detail. They're just little touches like that. I think they've, you know, that that's what game designers should aspire to in terms of. That level, I think, is just perfect. Mm. I don't think any of us have actually taken one of our games and actually blinged it up ourselves, have we? I mean, I've got also got the Ticket to Ride 10th Anniversary Edition. Mm. That's lovely, though. And that that's another one that's absolutely lovely, but that is completely unnecessary because Ticket to Ride already exists. <laughs> you know, it's exactly the same game, but you've now got all the little tins that the trains are in and the trains are little... You know, little zoo carriages with giraffes' heads sticking out That's or whiskey cool. barrels on the back. It's beautiful. They're absolutely it's really amazing lovely. to look at. Yeah. yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of what, which game would I have blinged out? I was going to say the only, I mean, I've, I've got, I mean, a lot of my games are quite blingy as to start with. I mean, I think it's like you know, Mansions of Madness or Twilight Imperium, but you couldn't really bling those out any further. See, I was about to think the only you got to play, got to pick a game you play a lot. Mm. And I've already done it with X-Wing. I've gone and bought the third-party acrylic movement dials mm. because, you know, you get you get the cardboard ones in the game and I've bought the acrylic ones that um, look really nice. And I can, I've done it a smidgen with um, Arkham Horror and I've bought little bits and pieces just to change some of the tokens. Mm. Oh, yeah. You, n- nothing, nothing major yet. Like, I've bought the Arkham Horror dice, so you you get some bog standard D6 with it, but they've also produced some black and green Arkham Horror dice. And I think that's the probably the one I would... Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror, the ones I would keep on taking that a little bit a step further. Mm-hmm. You could probably bling out Dead of Winter quite nicely. You could up, the, up all the standees to miniatures. It's unnecessary, but... The standees are quite nice in that, though. Well, they are, think. that's just the thing. It would be completely unnecessary bling. Yeah. But you could do it. The only game... I've sort of blinged out. Have a guess. <laughs> Robo Rally. No, it's <laughs> And the only thing I've changed in it is that one Christmas, my dad's got a CNC machine, so I asked him to make me a box to put it in because having about, well, pretty much all the expansions, there's just, you can't fit it all in one box normally. So he's got this, um, it's all like, you know, little bits of um, thin plywood all, all glued together. It's all painted really nicely. It's got like a big binder that goes all the way around the box uh, and it actually nice. keeps the thing together except that I bought like four or five expansions after we made it and now it doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> so maybe that'll be another Christmas present. <laughs> that, that came up on, on the um, Board Game Trading and Chat UK Facebook group. Mm. There's another one for you, Bromley. <laughs> Where... Uh, <laughs> The same the question came up, and the argument was made that buying things to store it wasn't blinging up the game, because they're things for packaging that help you store it and, and oh, you know tear down and tidy. Oh, the shite! That's bling. 
It's blink, yeah. yeah. If, 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 if you open the box, and it's not just loads of baggies all thrown in Pretty there, then it's blink. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is ex- it's like someone has put an expl- a grenade in a Tesco carrier bag. Bang! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this kind of adds to it as well, because it keeps all the cards in order. Like You can lift the sections out, and you can actually use them to keep the bits and pieces organised while That's you're playing nice. the game. Mm. Like It actually That's does genuinely cool. improve playing the game. Talisman. <laughs> Oh, so it makes it quicker to set up, Andy. Exactly. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Yes. So you can get and to yeah, stabbing your buddies to put in the it back away faster. Again as well. <laughs> <laughs> so any games where you thought the packaging was unnecessary then? Because we mentioned packaging with... FFG's trenches. FFG's trenches. Yep. Well, yeah. Every talisman yeah, expansion. Trench. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, yeah, uh, Mysterium's packaging's wank as well. That That is... It is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The look I, on your um, face agrees. Yeah, I got Mysterium at the expo and I bought the expansion and I put the expansion in the box and then realised it didn't quite fit. No, but even the base game fits, but it doesn't respond well to not being stored flat. Yeah, but that's more, <laughs> that's more poor insert design, isn't it? I, I think what Ben's trying to get at is... Uh, we, played, we mentioned Splendour a little... Did we mention Splendour earlier? Yes, we mentioned Splendour earlier. So Splendour... In, it's a game which is basically just a deck of cards and some poker chips. And if you look on the internet for images of this, where someone has taken the insert out and put the poker chips and the cards back in the box. And it's just this wee tiny bit in the corner. Yes, yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what on earth are you doing? Yes. Actually, there is a question to, to answer Gaz at the Village Meeple here. Have you ever you know seen a Blink That Game and thought, why on earth did you bother? What's that one by Andy um, Chambers? The one that you fucking hate that costs 50 quid? <laughs> um, Dark Deeds. There you go. That's that one. It's just unnecessary. You could have done that it for a tenner. Necessary. Could have done that for a tenner and a lot of us would have bought it, yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Sorry, Chambers, £45? Are you having a laugh? Yeah, that's definitely the most over game. Yeah, because that was reflected in the price, and you kind of went, if half that, and I'd buy it, not at that price. It does sound yeah, pretty exactly. bonkers, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple has asked us, do we do chips? Yes. Yes, we do. I've got a deep fat fryer. I do chips now and again. And better than chips, he does scotch eggs. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. The black pudding ones. They, they were good, weren't they? With proper stone away black pudding, they were amazing. They were literally but, amaze balls. <laughs> that was it was it was heart attack on a plate, but it was really good. They were what was what was the word? Um, substantial. <laughs> yeah, I've never managed to eat more than half of one without feeling sick. <laughs> wow, that's good, and in, in, in a good way, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. As in, I've just eaten something the, the richest, fattiest thing I've ever eaten in my life. And although I would oh, yeah. happily eat another half, I will definitely be violently ill if I try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a ringing endorsement for me. <laughs> Andy, your food's so good it makes me puke. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really tempted to try it. <laughs> Do it. Mark Cook from Aircon, yes, the esteemed leader of the Aircon uh, convention. The big man himself. There's quite a few. The big man himself, yes. Uh, Desert Island board games. If the three of you were stranded on a desert island, which game would you each take to play with the other two? I think we've answered this before, haven't we? Or something very similar. Probably, yeah. Which is the one we'd sort of run into a board game shop and grab at a zombie apocalypse? It was the zombie apocalypse we asked last time, wasn't it? Yeah, so a similar sort of idea. Um, uh, which one would I take? See, the zombie one, we said D&D. Yeah, that's right. There's three of us now, but only one of us would need to bring D&D. Mm. What would I bring to play with you two? Probably either Mansions of Madness. But you're on a desert island. Are you going to get an iPad with you? You're going to run out of charge, uh, aren't it's, you? It's, 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 an, it's an island with connectivity. It's one of Branson's islands. Uh, okay. It's probably got cable. But you're not deserted, are you? Because you can just go, dear Google, I'm stuck on this <laughs> island. Could someone please come and rescue me? Shut up. <laughs> it doesn't say deserted. It says desert island. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fair point. But it does say you're stranded. Uh, it doesn't say for how long. See, I reckon you should take Twilight Imperium. Yes. Yes. That's a great idea. Because A, we'd finally find time to play it. Yep. 
once. B, the box is big enough. You can make a raft. One of us could use it as a boat. <laughs> <laughs> And if things got desperate and you were getting really cold, you could probably burn it for a few months. <laughs> you could. If I would make two rafts because you've got the base and the lid. <laughs> That's it. So you draw straws. One of you is staying behind. In fact... We play a game to work out you know, whoever loses is one that's going to stay that's behind. That's a great idea. Right, done. We've got to do this. Okay, in that fact, if, you, if Steve, if you're taking D&D and Andy, you're taking Twilight Imperium... I'm going to take giant Jenga. We can use that to keep ourselves warm. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Done. There we go. Giant Jenga, we could probably build a shelter out of. Build a raft we out could of it. Make a cabin. <laughs> you live in it. Oh, that would be great. Not for Mark Cook, though. No, true. No. But if we, made a, if we made a Jenga that was big enough for Mark Cook, then I could have, you know, I could live like a king. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I think you are actually literally half his size, aren't you? Pretty much, yeah. He's a giant of a man. <laughs> and I am smaller than a giant. <laughs> mm. So what kind of dice do you think would do the most damage if chucked into the Large Hadron Collider? Well, that's got to be your metal dice. Oh, my God. I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. you could they, they, They'd drop right through the bottom. They're really good, though. And then they'd roll 20. <laughs> yes. They do roll that D twenty does roll well. It has to be said. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, obviously they're not going to pass a float test in the sense that they will not float. But I do think they're slightly biased. <laughs> they're fine. Mm-hmm. Actually, the last couple of sessions I've had, I've I've rolled a lot of low numbers. Somehow, a warlock managed to survive getting stabbed by four goblins. Well done. Just because of my crappy rolling. So I think it's actually fine. It's just, you know, the 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 statistics are acting over a long time scale. <laughs> you just save <laughs> up all the good rolls for when I'm rolling ones against you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Just to really well, Here's a in. good one. <laughs> this is going to get a lot of value from Steve. I'm looking forward to hearing the answer to this one. It's been 22 years since Catan was first published and arguably started the rise of board games. Calm down, Steve. Do you think gaming will be more or less popular in another 22 years? No, I didn't realise it was that old, actually. I thought it was more like 15, but yeah, blimey. Okay, we all know I hate Catan, but I will admit it has been instrumental in bringing board games to... A wider audience. A wider audience, shall we say. It was so political. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my actual view is it brought board games to America. I don't think we we've, we've had games workshop for years, so I've got my own opinion on this. It's true, yeah. And Germany, and they produce quite a few board games. Do you think gaming will be more or less popular in another 22 years? The weird thing is I think it's hard to tell because over the last 5 or 6 years mm. the entire board game industry has exploded. Mm. Yeah, now, does the, does, does the bubble keep going or will it burst? Will it burst? Well, it's like UK Games Expo, like, five years ago, was basically done in the lobby of a hotel. You know, now it's taken up two halls in the NEC and it looks like it's going to be three next hotel. year. Yeah. That's a good question. And also, not not just that, there's also apps now creeping into board games. So we're getting sort of computerization. Mm. I mean, we like, you know, the, the, the app-driven the app sort of So You know, we've, we've said Mansions of Madness and so on and so forth. But we've also covered um, VR. You I was know, you're just getting, about um, to say, it's, gonna, it's definitely going to explode, but it's going to involve way more AR, I think. Yeah. Not just, if it's VR, it's not a board game anymore. <laughs> but yeah, augmented yeah. reality, okay. where, you know, you, you put on your goggles and then elements of your cardboard bits and pieces come to life. I could well see that sort of stuff carrying on. I'd say so, actually. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's almost going to be like the little game that they were playing on Star in Star Wars in the Millennium Falcon, where you always have to let the Wookiee win. You've got those <laughs> little sort of animated things on the table. It might end up looking like that. I think it'll either go like that, or it'll get to the point where, um, with things like augmented reality and virtual reality and things, there will be no need to have actual board games because you could just actually be part of the game. Hmm. So we just we need to plug into the matrix and then we're done. Exactly. Twenty two years at so the rate technology is going at the moment. I think, yeah, I think it'll go like to that. To be honest, I don't know. We've 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 yet to master three D on tellies, and it's taken 50, forty years to do that. So remember, in the eighties, had those blue and red things. They were shit, and uh, you know we've got the the glasses now, and they're less less shit, but still not great. 
I don't know. I think the whole point of board games is they're not video games. That's what they reckon. But one of the reasons why it's a bit of an explosion at the moment is that it's take you know people people who are playing board games now are the people who've grown up with video games, mm. Mm. and they've suddenly gone. Well, video games have gone a bit shit. I'm gonna get back. I'm gonna get into board games. I do worry it's a bit of a bubble because I'm seeing a lot of the business practices which people accuse the video game industry of being shit about are starting to creep in. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It'll, it'll ebb and flow. 22 years is a long time. I think board games are here to stay. Whether it be more or less popular depends on what if we're on a kind of cycle at this point. Mm. You know, will, it, will it peak in the next year or two and then drop? I mean, at the moment, it sounds like it's no, there's no chance of it dropping but uh, i i I do wonder things can't sustain the level they are at the moment certainly the kickstarter behavior i don't think no Uh, yeah i have a funny feeling well i say this every year my views on kickstarter uh, change every six months anyway Mm -hmm. but yeah there's there's a feeling especially with the whole simon kickstarter model yes part of me that thinks at some point that whole that whole thing is going to burst i could see it continuing as it is for at least another five years expanding you think yeah I think uh, there's people have got a bit more cash these days, and I think people, you know, want a break from the digital world a bit more. So at least for the next five, before these other technologies maybe take more of a center stage and more mainstream, I reckon it'll continue to grow. It is a bit more mm. social than video games, to be fair. Yeah, mm. you know, physically social rather than you know chatting over the internet, mm. which is nice. Yep. Um, okay. And Mark's last question. Uh, if you were going to Gen Con this year, what would be the thing you'd most like to do there? Oh. Beat Andy at more board games. Beat, and, beat Andy at more board games? It's not going to happen. I, I wouldn't would <laughs> go all the way to Atlanta to do that, I must admit. Uh, well, presumably all three of us sorry, would go. Atlanta, what am I about? In, in Indianapolis, what am I talking about? Presumably all three of us would go, so there's a good chance we would play some games together. One, sort of mm. one or two, yeah. That said, I think the one thing I would do is seek out Jamie get Stegmaier and give him a big wet kiss. <laughs> <laughs> is that all? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a hug as well. Big man hug. <laughs> and then offer to bear his children. <laughs> well, you know, we'll see how the night goes. Depends how much we've had to drink. But yeah, probably. And then Steve and I would drag drag you away and apologise <laughs> profusely for your behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fine, a fine man who creates high quality games. Uh, <laughs> um, I see. I hear some quite interesting things about Gen Con. I, I don't know whether I want to try the Living Dungeon or whether it sounds like a Rag Week project gone wrong. Because mm. Living Dungeon is this thing they do. You can you can take part in this. It, it it sounds like nightmare to be fair. Yeah, yeah, it probably it sounds, will be. It sounds like you actually take part in this, like a version of nightmare, but everyone takes a character class and how you do things are little puzzles. Like you know, I think I think one of the magic things is you've got to, you know throw something to hit a target or something like that. And all the stories you hear about it, it sounds quite interesting, but at the same time, it sounds cheesy and awful. So I'm not sure if I'd want to do that or not. It's sort of like board gaming larping. I'd like to go to see Gen Con just for the spectacle. I must yeah. admit, you know, it's. I'd love to go, but I also don't see me ever going due to the entire ball lake that's yeah, involved. It's, it's what ten hours of travel from here, realistically, well, isn't it? I'd say that side of it, I can understand because it's you know, you in America, you've got to do that. It's the whole thing about trying to book hotels. It's the whole thing about trying to book event tickets mm. and yeah. everything about it just sounds like it's a complete nightmare. They've, I've even heard people say like American podcasts, like it takes three hours to get your press pass because the queue for the press pass is that long fuck that <laughs> so actually the thing i most like to do <laughs> this is referencing another podcast i'd like to go to the secret cabal meetup because that sounds awesome yeah. they've hired out <laughs> an entire brewery for it oh hell yeah right why aren't we there <laughs> we'll show them how it's done Another question from Philip James Harker. Do you have any specific house rules for games you play that you feel work better than the written rules? Um, no. Other than Monopoly, but everyone does that. I See, I don't actually house rule stuff very often. No, me uh, neither. I think we tend to either take the rules as they were, um, because, well, for one thing, it saves, <laughs> it saves arguments. <laughs> but also... I think it takes something away from a game if you have to invent 
your own rules for it. I think we're at that point. We've got that many games we can play mm. that you tend to tend to go. If it needs house ruling, then it's not good enough. So yeah. sell it on. Yeah, yeah. it's probably not yeah. a game for us. One exception to that is um, Dan's house rules because uh, Tuesday night gaming Dan does house rule a couple of games. And Zaya Legends of a Drift system, he has house ruled that, and I think that makes a big difference. Mm. So what's he done to it? Well, Zaya is effectively a leak to the board game. Right. Ooh. It's a space game where you take a ship, um, you start off with a little tiny ship, and then you can like hunt down bad guys, trade goods, explore. You can basically do whatever you want, and you get like fame points for doing these things. But the game itself is extremely random. Like, it is roll and move, so you get a dice for the size of your engine, and you roll that move that many spaces. Right. You also, when you do the trading, there's no set trading paths. You basically just take the next cube out of a bag, and so, if, if I remember correctly, so it ends up that you could end up trading something with someone who's basically across the road. Right. So you so basically you can just, you know, you can shuffle back and forth. So he, he the things he's done is he's, Change the roll and move so it adds an extra dice. So what you do is like a bit like you were saying with Labyrinth. Mm. You roll basically two dice and pick the best one. So there's still a little bit of roll and move in it, but it's not like, oh, I've rolled a D20 and rolled a two kind of thing. Right, okay. And the other thing he said is he seeded the trading thing so that if you're trading goods, you have do have to travel across the system, the solar system, in order to trade. Yeah, speaking of Dan, actually, we were considering house ruling one of the rules in Eclipse, or rather one of the pieces of equipment in Eclipse, those missiles that you can buy, the plasma missiles, because we plasma think they're, missiles. Yeah, they're too cheap and too powerful. But he has told me that in the first expansion, Rise of the Ancients, it sorts it out. Oh, okay. So you don't need to. So I'm yet to play the expansions, despite owning all of them. <laughs> but unfortunately, I just don't get eclipsed to the table often enough. Mm. So Andy, Philip asks another question. Where did you get those awesome Space Invader dice? I got them from actual from from, from Phil himself. Um, he's a <laughs> member of uh, a roller derby team, and he made these things, uh, these custom D sixes. They're multicolored. So you can get a black one, a white one, or a green one. And he sells a set of three for about three quid or something. So about a pound of D six. But instead of the one, he's got one of the classic inv- uh, space invader uh, symbols on it, and they're engraved hmm. into the dice. They look really cool. Does that so, not yes, make them um, more likely to roll? A one, in fact. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Because there's less material and on that face now. Maybe. Does he only sell them to you by any chance, Andy? No, 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 no. He takes <laughs> them to... Um, he's got thousands of these bloody things. He takes them to all the, the roller derby events he goes to. And you can buy them online from him as well if you get in touch with him. So he's on Facebook. Hmm. Find him out. Philip James, Philip James Harker. So he takes them to all these events. And he said, do you want to buy some, Andy? And he kind of didn't really give me any choice. I was like, yeah, go on then. And they're actually pretty <laughs> cool. I like them. Very so good. I bought two sets. One quick one from my friend Sarah. In Snakes and Ladders, what is the correct outcome if you have to slide down but the snake is intersected with a ladder? My four-year-old nephew insists he doesn't need to go to the end of the snake. I think that he's cheating. Yes. Yes, he is. We agree. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Although he's four, and so... Punish him! Well, you've got to weigh up. Is it worth teaching him the ways of the world, or is it worth not having to deal with another fucking tantrum? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, no, teach him right. You're going down the ladder, sunshine, and I don't care if you don't like going it. Going down the ladder? Oh, yeah, Sorry, house snake. snakes Whatever. <laughs> yeah, down it the really ladder, the snakes, there you go. <laughs> um, and now a fairly hefty question we have from our, our uh, mutual friend, As. As Johnston asks, top three most significant games to each of you? Now, that's quite a difficult question. First one, hero quest. Oh, yes. Hero Quest was the gateway into the wider kind of world. It introduced me to Games Workshop. It introduced me to Citadel Miniatures, which then led to Space Marine and Warhammer 40,000. The best thing about Hero Quest is it got Steve into miniatures. (laughs) Yes. And that in itself (laughs) is perfect. (laughs) Yeah. I would say the next significant game, it's going to be Dungeons & Dragons. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I got Dungeons and Dragons the year after I got Hero Quest, and it introduced me to RPGs, wow. which introduced me to the other side of the hobby. Steve has had a beard ever since. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Now the last one, significant game for me. Is it Catan? No. <laughs> <laughs> Wash your mouth out. 
<laughs> the back of my hand it is either going to have to be Carcassonne or Arkham Horror there had to be because, an Arkham game in there well because Carcassonne is the reason why I went hunting down a game shop because uh, Amanda was playing Carcassonne on the Xbox and I decided to look for a physical copy of it mm. so we hunted around Worcester for a game shop and stumbled across Toys and Games and the thing that caught my attention the most in that game shop was Arkham Horror. Because mm. it was Call of Cthulhu board game. So it's between those two because those two things, the thing that kind of got, well, they did get me back into board games after an absence away. So to me, that's significant to me. Yeah. I'd probably say Arkham Horror would probably be the one because I love Lovecraft. Mm. And it's a great game. Really? You've, you've, you've never mentioned that before, Steve. There's tentacles appearing behind him behind the couch now on his, on his webcam. <laughs> <laughs> My first one, actually, for similar reasons, you mentioned there, Space Hulk, uh, the first edition, because mm. I had that and I really, really regret selling it now, but never mind. And I, I loved Space Hulk. I think it was brilliant. I loved the idea of the 40K theme. Uh, I did have 40K and stuff as well, but I really enjoyed Space Hulk. I played that to death. Got all the expansions, Deathwing, Gene Stealer. It introduced me to all of the, the Gene Stealer and Tyranid side of things as well. So I ended up building a Tyranid army in 40k and all that sort of stuff. So really enjoyed uh, Space Hulk. I like the idea of just breaking into a sort of derelict spacecraft and just sort of poncing around and shooting things. It was great. Viticulture, actually, slightly more modern, because it's absolutely definitely the, the most played game between myself and Alora. We love playing it. It's a really, really nice game. Um, we know it inside out now, which is quite good, and especially with Tuscany. So we play that tons. So really like that. That's a favourite for for me and my good lady. Hmm. And I am kind of torn between D and D and Eclipse. Actually, I'm probably going to say D and D because I've been playing it longer, like yourself, Steve. I've been playing it since Eye of the Beholder, you know, on the Amiga, way hmm. back in the day. So that's possibly first edition rules. But then, you know, really got into it through Baldur's Gate. And I loved, absolutely still love, I'm playing through it again at the moment, Baldur's Gate and the Baldur's Gate saga. is just superb. Such a good story. As far as I can tell, you've been replaying Baldur's Gate for at least the last five to ten years, basically since I've known you. <laughs> it's always like... I've played it a few times. It's always like every couple of weekends, like, so I'm replaying Baldur's Gate again now. <laughs> it's, I, I, it's it's kind of one continuous replaying because I've not actually got to the end of it because it's so bloody massive. <laughs> so I've got a question because I keep saying to myself I should replay Baldur's Gate because I played Baldur's Gate but never, even though I bought it, I never played Baldur's Gate 2. Mm. <laughs> I bought it and for some reason never actually played oh, you it. idiot. So... Should I go out and buy like the super advanced deluxe versions are out at the moment and yes. replay them? Yes, 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 you should. You get it for the PS4. Baldur's Gate 2 is better than Baldur's no. Gate 1. Just PC. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's then, PC. Yeah, it's mouse and. Oh, yeah, you're not going to get this on a console. Mm. No. Um, but yeah, then I'll get Throne of Baal as well, which is like the expansion for. I think the uh, advanced versions can include all the um, yeah because I've got them on PC. I've now I've yeah I bought the enhanced editions because they basically updated both versions for the 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 Infinity Engine two whatever it was that BG two was written in. So the whole thing's now written written in this. They've fixed bugs. They've added characters and a few other plot details as well. So yeah, definitely get it. It is enormous. I mean, you're talking fifty to hundred hours per game. Oh yeah, it's massive, but it is so good. But yes, definitely, 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 definitely. Have I told the story about when I played Baldur's Gate? No. I bought it just before the summer holidays when I was in uni, and it was my second, end of my second year in uni. And I started playing it at home on my computer, and I had full intentions of basically playing this all summer. Right. You know, 12 weeks or whatever it is, the ridiculous holidays <laughs> you got when you're in university. And I managed to get to two weeks before my dad quite literally frog marched me to the temporary oh, work agency. <laughs> 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 I got factory jobs the rest of the summer. Oh, oh, no. See, I started playing Baldur's Gate at uni. I was in fourth year, so my final sort of undergrad year. And, you know, I, I basically started playing it one sort of Friday night. And I think I emerged from my room a few days later after I'd been declared legally dead. It was, just that, it was just that addictive. It was so good. Was that because of the I will smell? Give you one, possibly. My roommate, just, God, I think he's dead in there. We've not seen him for days. <laughs> I will give you one piece of advice to play Baldur's Gate, Steve. Keep What's the that? golden pantaloons. Really? I yes. remember them. I will not say why, but just keep them. 
sound okay. advice. Oh my god, it's available on iPad as well. Yeah, it makes sense because it's just point and click, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, getting back to the question. <laughs> Go on then. It's your your three. My John. three. Your three. <laughs> Don't look at me like think, that. Oh, we know what it's gonna be. So the first one. Yeah. It has to be, and this will be a surprise to you, Mystic Wood. Ooh. So this is something is that, that actually came up when I went on uh, the We're Not Wizards podcast. I'd kind of forgotten about it, but there was this game. It's sort of like a kind of 2D talisman almost. Basically, it's like a, a wood you've got to explore. It's really simplistic. So me and my sister... Is it mystical? Uh, yeah, there's sort of mystical mm. stuff in there. Like there's a witch. There's uh, you've got to basically find a prince or a princess or something like that, and navigate your way through this. Um, there are sequence of tiles upside down. Navigate your way through it to try and get through the the maze. Find your whatever it is you're trying to find and get back out again. Whoever does that first wins. Um, but that one, like me and my sister used to play it for, like. Uh, you know, it'd be like Saturday morning, we'd get up at six o'clock in the morning, we'd play that for like two hours before my parents <laughs> came to. <laughs> and that's sort of, uh, I think that was one of the earliest kind of non-Monopoly type games that I ever played. So that probably mm. seeded some of my lust for the, the gaming genre. Your darkest desires. <laughs> yeah, so that was a big one. I kind of want to say... Um, Warhammer well, 40k because I spent a lot of my teenage years painting models and playing that, uh, even if I read the rules wrong a couple of times. <laughs> um, 56 inches explosion. That's the one. Uh, but we had a lot of fun playing that game, and yeah, you can't you can't take that those years back. So that that's another big one, uh, and another one that kind of triggered me getting back into games mid university was Robo Rally. So on a on a um, a weekend of LAN partying. We got bored of playing computer games, and one of the guys said, I've got this board game. Why don't we play this? And we all looked at him a bit quizzically. Uh, like, What's a board, board game? Board game, really? He had to play computer games, but all right. And about five minutes into the game, I was like, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> Let's play some more of this. Uh, yeah. Awesome. And that led me back into looking at board games, which obviously led me on to Talisman. But I've had my three, so I can't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, by the way, listening to your Were Not Wizards um, visit, mm. um, you were just trying to remember a game you were looking forward to, but you couldn't remember the name. Yeah. And that game was Gloom of Killforce. That's the Badger. Yes. <laughs> I, I was in my car listening to that, and you're going, oh, I was really excited about this game. It's an adventure game, and I couldn't remember what it was called. And I'm shouting at the radio, it's Gloom of Killforce, <laughs> you cretin. <laughs> Gloom of Clil Killforce. Gloom, gloom of Killforth, That's a different game. <laughs> Is this the same shouting that I was doing to, to my mobile phone whilst listening to the podcast saying, it's fucking hackers, you moron, for the love of God? Anyone would think we did it deliberately. <laughs> Johnny Lee Miller, Angelina Jolie, it's hackers, one of the best films of the 80s. Yeah. I can't believe neither of you two could get hackers. Anyway, it made for good listening, right? <laughs> It was infuriating, Listy. <laughs> well, you know, we got we got it straight away, and then we thought, let's edit it out a bit and put some confusion in there. Unfortunately for you, I also know that Richard does fuck all editing, so I know that you two are basically <laughs> cretins. Uh, you knew that anyway. <laughs> yes. I think I wrote it on a tweet. On a tweet. On a tweet. What's that film where Angel- <laughs> on a tweet? On a tweet. <laughs> What's that film where Angelina Jolie plays a hacker and Johnny Lee hmm. Miller plays a hacker? hacker. What's that <laughs> called? I think I Gladiator, said Gladiator, that'll be it. I think I said at the time. Is it Sneaker? <laughs> Sne- you did. Sneakers. You know, what is it? A film about running shoes. No, Sneakers is a great film. It is about hacking. It's been a long time since I've seen that film. I've seen Sneakers. Yeah. I've, I've watched Hackers not too long ago, and boy, that film has aged badly. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Mess with the best, die like the rest. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, good grief. We have one more question, boys. We do. Go on, then. Let's round us off. Our friend Paul, from our Tuesday Night yes. Gaming group, um, based on the announcement of the FFG Fallout game yesterday, and this is our link back to the, the Wasteland, uh, yes. the best and worst uses of licenses... Do you think licenses help or hinder creativity? 
Well, the worst that springs to mind is Labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I don't know, Portal was pretty messed up as well. I really enjoyed I Portal. I thought Portal was a good game. Yeah. Portal's a good game, but I it, it's, it's I don't think they've handled it very well. It's a poor use of the licence. Yeah, it is a poor use yeah, of the okay. licence. The poor one I can think of is actually one I played with Paul a few weeks back, which was uh, Bloodborne. Hmm. Uh, there's a uh, board it's, game of it. No, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, the uh, cardy game. It's by Eric Lang. Oh, well, it's by Simon. Oh, well. And I, it's, it's starting to mean my, um, my Eric Lang luster is starting to fade after playing this. Because it's, <laughs> it's losing its luster. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, is it lacking a luster, perhaps? It's so tangentially related to the video game that it feels like as if. <laughs> right, this is a really weird analogy, but there's a there's a story about um have you heard of Apex Twin? Yes. Bloody good rave band. No. <laughs> band. <laughs> well rave DJ band. group. Yes. Collective. There's a story whatever. that he was commissioned to do a remix and uh, somebody turns up and says, I'm here to collect the remix you're supposed to have done, and he kinda went, Oh shit. I forgot about that, uh, and just handed them a random CD because this remix seems to include absolutely no music from the original song he was remixing. I think it's actually a Nine Inch Nails remix. <laughs> and I feel as if that's what Eric Lang did. Somebody turned up and said, so how's the Bloodborne card game coming along? And he kind of um, went, um, it's here. give us a minute just to put the final artwork on and it'll be fine. Here it is. <laughs> Whoops. It sounds like the um, hash of um, the Game of Thrones game they're chucking out at the moment. Oh, which one's that one? The new Simon game. Have you not seen that? Oh, you get, yeah. I yeah, was tempted that by one. that at first, and I gave up on it. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people have done the same. They've looked at it and went, "Hang on a minute, what? this is shit." What to say bad about it? <laughs> Well, it's a rank and file miniatures game. So we, in the last episode, we talked about Rune Wars, and yep. to be fair, this is kind of Rune Wars' biggest competitor could be. So it's a rank and file miniatures game set in the Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire. It's called actually is what they called it, isn't it? Rather than Game yeah, of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. So you've got Lannisters versus Starks in the base set, but the rules look really basic. Yeah. So you've got miniatures on movement trace, you've got little rectangular regiments moving around the battlefield. The miniatures look nice, of course, because it's Simon. But there's a run through the rules, and it felt like it was simpler and more abstract. I say not more abstract, sorry, simpler than Warhammer Fantasy Battles was. Right. And it really was just a case of move and roll a dice. And I just kind of thought, well, there's not going to be much strategy left in that. But the really, the interesting rules, but the weird thing they've done it, is you've got this kind of tactics cards which can play miniatures too which give you bonuses but that's where most of the interesting miniatures are used because Tyrion's not going to be in the middle of a battlefield but there's a Tyrion miniature and all he basically is is a counter to put on a little spot Mm. Yeah, and the same for Cersei and Melisandre and people like that are all going to be just these tokens it's like you've just found an excuse to use a miniature there when yeah. there's overproduction for you because a token could have done that no problem mm. and not only that there's multiple versions of certain of the miniatures apparently yes which is just like why why, why are you doing that we don't care that much nice to paint but pointless for the game mm. so I was interested in that to begin with but about halfway through the, as soon as the Kickstarter launched I kind of lost interest straight away yeah it doesn't look it just, uh, that exciting really no mm. I mean, it'll um, sell gangbusters of course but Anyway, so good uses of licenses. You're going to say Lovecraft, aren't you, Tudor? Well, it's not really a license, you see, because that nothing has really managed to capture the proper Lovecraft thing. So I don't know. Mansions oh, is pretty bloody good. Man- so Mansions is, Arkham, is pretty really. damn good. I have to say, I actually think that FFG Fallout game could well be very good. Like the opportunities that you've got with Fallout, I could see there being a lot of scope for a decent game coming out of that. Mm. What's interesting is that's the second Fallout game announced this year. Yeah. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, because there's the Modiphius Miniatures game coming out, and it's interesting how they've both been announced the same year. 
Um, I'm just trying to think what's a really good use of a license. Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yeah, that's a good yes, one. Yes, that's a really good game. And that works. Battle I would Star say Galactica. that. I've that's a great expansion, so. That's a great example of a game that works the theme into the mechanics of the game perfectly. Yes. Yes. Very, very good point, John. I mean, even to the point where, like, which character is it? Is it Helos? He, he, he doesn't turn up until like, the third round of the game. Yeah. Because he did, because he's tra- in, in the TV series, he's trapped on Earth. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God, what's another one? X-Wing. Oh, X-Wing. How can I forget about X-Wing? <laughs> well, in fact, a lot of the Star Wars games from FFG, the uh, X-Wing, Armada, Imperial Assault I like, but I'm actually going liking less. And, of course, Rebellion. Mm. Mm. Star Wars Rebellion is brilliant. Yes. Fantastic use of the license, that one is. Mm. Really, really good game. One generic worst use, I would say, are things like all the Munchkin variants that are just themes of you know it's just it's just another it's exactly the same game but they've just you know skinned it with whatever the theme is and there's plenty of other love letter ones yeah Yeah. although munchkin loot letter is fun yeah but that's that's love letter just with some munchkin art on and then they've done a batman love letter Mm. which is exactly the same game but with pictures of batman and the joker on yes i think that one i mean sometimes the themes are fun but you don't really get anything they're not using the license to enhance the game so before I forget, I just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to one of our fellow podcasting uh, channels, which is uh, at the Hordecast. So these guys do a kind of uh, Dungeons and Dragons type podcast, which basically consists of them making up a kind of D and D session and weaving in questions they've read off of Reddit and answering them about D and D topics. Uh, and the first couple are a little bit. They're obviously excited about doing a podcast, <laughs> but <laughs> but if you get through those first couple, it's worth it's worth listening to them. Even so, because it sets some of the story. They reuse the themes as it goes on. It's like a D and D campaign that continues, and I've just been listening oh, to cool. it for the last week or so, and it's just it's a lot of fun. So I just thought I'd give them a shout out. <laughs> so you guys, nice you guys should have a listen. It's good. Cool. I oh, shall so put that into my. Over large list of podcasts to listen Indeed. to. Indeed, <laughs> I need to add a few. Yep. I think Richard needs to stop recording so many. Yes. Just slow down. You're making <laughs> us look bad. No, he doesn't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just slow down. You're making us look even worse. <laughs> right then, folks. I believe we should call it a day. Our sacks are empty. So, thank you very much for listening. I've been Stephen Polyhedron Collado. I've been Andy. And I've been John Cage. As per usual, if you want to read or know more of our stuff, we are online at www.polyhedroncladder.com. We're on Twitter at Polyhedron C. At Sonic H. And at John underscore Cage. We shall hope to be back in a couple more weeks with some more board gaming goodness. Until then, tatty bye. Tatty bye. Catch you later.